Hi, I'm Marty McCary with MedPage Today. I'm here with Dr. Dori Segev, a professor and transplant surgeon at Johns Hopkins, a good friend and colleague. Dori, I wanna switch um, gears for a second. You've also done broader research on COVID risk among those who are immunosuppressed and those who have had organ transplant. Trying to get at the question, are those groups at higher risk of getting COVID infection and are they at higher risk of dying from COVID? So can you talk a little bit about that body of research that you've been working on and that has come out over the last couple months? Yeah, so you know, early on in the pandemic, um, transplant patients did not fare well whatsoever to COVID infection. There were more reported mortality rates in the 40 to 50% range um, from the US, from Europe, this was really, really scary for transplant patients. Um, as we've learned how to take care of this disease of COVID-19 in general, in everybody, um, we've learned also how to take care of it in transplant patients. It's interesting because, you know, the immunoinflammatory stage three of COVID infection is quite similar biologically to the immunoinflammatory process of allograft rejection, right? You have an immune system reaction that activates the inflammatory system that causes end organ damage. And we see that in transplant recipients. And we also see that in sort of that last stage of really bad COVID-19 infection. So it wasn't a huge surprise to us when administration of steroids, which is what we do for rejection, also worked for COVID-19 infection, right? So we're learning a lot about sort of how best to treat this in both our transplant patients and non-transplant patients to the point where even recently, our, our report, for example, at Hopkins showed that we were able to get the mortality of transplant patients to equal the mortality of non-transplant patients um, who get COVID-19. Now, some of this may have to do with the fact that Transplant patients, if you think about who is most carefully following public health guidelines, it is the people who know that they are at higher risk. And one of the things we, we, we have hypothesized is that the level of inoculum of disease that you get kind of dictates how aggressive that disease is going to be. And so if a transplant patient is sitting you know, in the vicinity of somebody who is spreading the, the, the virus, but they're wearing a mask, their risk of getting a higher inoculum is lower. And it's possible that they're actually coming in with less of an immune activation because they have you know, less of sort of an immunoinflammatory activation because they have seen a smaller inoculum of the virus. So that's one of the things that might actually be helping transplant patients in all of this is because they know they are immunosuppressed. They know they need to be more careful. Our transplant patients are always more careful in the community anyway, you know, around flu season and things like that. They're incredibly careful um, to keep themselves as healthy as possible. So it may be that we're seeing some of that from there. Now, one question that comes to mind, of course, is if somebody is a transplant patient, they've gotten a full vaccine series and they still have no detectable antibodies, what do we do for them? And the, the emergence and success of monoclonal antibodies could potentially help patients. So my understanding right now is that at least while on the day that we're speaking today, um, post-exposure prophylaxis is available readily from on a clinical level to, to people. So I would say if you're a transplant patient, you have no antibodies and you got, there was any question of exposure to COVID-19, we should be treating those patients with post-exposure monoclonal antibody prophylaxis. What I'm hoping is that the pre-exposure trials prove efficacious and we may even be able to give pre-exposure prophylaxis to, uh, to transplant patients. But that, you know, that's something for for hopefully the near future. So in terms of uh, summarizing an estimate of the quantified risk to transplant recipients and the quantified risk to those on immunosuppression who are not transplant recipients of getting the infection and dying of the infection, where would you put those numbers roughly? So pre-vaccine era, I would have said that immunosuppressed patients were, you know, in exactly the same scenario 
probably five to 10 times more likely of acquiring the disease compared to immunocompetent people. Um, and that then their mortality, you know, could be the same or higher depending on the care that they give. So I think that that would be quite variable. Could it be um, better? Could I it... don't think it could be better, but I, I think if with really good care and with, you know, the luck of detecting it early, et cetera, et cetera, it could be equivalent. I think post vaccine, now this risk difference is even higher, right? Because immunocompetent people are going to get vaccinated, they're going to be fine. You know, as as we've discussed before, um, you know, people who are immune, who are around other people who are immune, they're, they're, you know, it's almost life as it was ever before. And, you know, even the CDC guidelines are kind of catching up with that. Um, but I would say that immunosuppressed people will not have as robust of an immune response, and now will be even more at risk than their sort of general population counterparts. Again, emphasizing that their bubbles, the people that they live with, the people that they see on a regular basis, need to be vaccinated and need to be prioritized for that vaccination. And how much of that, um, that surprise in the data that those immunocompromised who get COVID don't have a significantly worse mortality risk how much of that do you think is the steroids that they may be on chronically? It could be, you know, I, <clears throat> a year ago, I would have told you, you know, transplant patients are not going to do well with COVID-19 because this is a really bad disease. They're immunosuppressed. They, they've got, they're already three steps behind and then they're going to get really, really hurt from this. And early on that indeed was the case. And it was very, very scary. Um, I think, as we're learning, the fact that they're already on a regimen to stop immunoinflammatory responses from harming their allograft puts them now they were three steps behind. Now they're like back to being, you know, sort of on par with their immunocompetent counterparts. I would use a golf analogy, but I know nothing about golf, so I would totally get the golf analogy wrong. But you, you can insert one if you would like, Mari. <laughs> it's uh, it's good for your mental health that you uh, don't play golf. <laughs> Uh, now, this is what I love about your work, Dory. I think we were all really worried about organ transplant recipients and immunosuppressed patients. Um, I was certainly warning the public uh, and a lot of media channels back in the spring and pre-pandemic that when uh, we realized this could be bad, that this might be an exceptionally vulnerable group. So uh, thanks for all your research. Great study in JAMA. Congratulations. Any final thoughts here? Um, I guess my final thought is there's a lot we have left to learn about the immune system in immunosuppressed patients and its response to vaccines, but we are working hard to learn as much as we possibly can. And in the meantime, you know, the thing I'm telling transplant patients is do not assume you're immune just because you were vaccinated. For immunocompetent people, that is a totally reasonable assumption. For immunosuppressed people, we need more data. And, and so just to follow up on that point, uh, Dory, in your own clinical practice, how are you using the results to change your practice? Are you testing patients after vaccination for antibodies? So I would, I would say that any transplant patient who wants to do anything other than what they were doing prior to vaccination, which is, you know, to socially distance, to wear masks, to minimize contact with anybody else. Anyone who wants to relax their restrictions in any way should be antibody tested before allowing themselves to do that. Even antibody testing is not 100% guarantee. Remember, nothing is 100% here. But if, if you're going to say to yourself, I really need to hug my grandkids in order to feel alive, I got the vaccine, I'm going to say to you, if we don't check your antibodies, you can't have any reassurance that you actually had a response to the vaccine. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, great point, Story. Great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, doing this with us, and thanks for spending some time with MedPage. Yeah, great, great to see you, Marty, and great, uh, always great talking.